guys, this is Emily Moyer from Off Planet Radio, and we have a great show for, coming up for you. But before we get to that, I just wanted to say thank you for everybody for all the wonderful um, comments, responses, and messages that I got after the last show. I was having a tough time and uh, dealing with some issues and to be able to uh, talk about something that was so important to me and uh, have really the kind of response that we got was um, really amazing. So I just wanted to say thank you. And uh, we have something really special coming up right here for you. And before we get to it, do you guys remember this? Gentlemen, the uh, gentlelady from uh, Georgia, Ms. McKinney. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I watched President Bush deliver a moving speech at the United Nations in September 2003, in which he mentioned, he mentioned the crisis of the sex trade. The President called for the punishment of those involved in this horrible business. But at the very moment of that speech, DynCor was exposed for having been involved in the buying and selling of young women and children. While all of this was going on, DynCor kept the Pentagon contract to administer the smallpox and anthrax vaccines and is now working on a plague vaccine through the Joint Vaccine Acquisition Program. Mr. Secretary, is it policy of the U.S. government to reward companies that traffic in women and little girls? That's my first question. My second question, Correct. Mr. Secretary, according to the Comptroller General of the United States, there are serious financial pro management problems at the Pentagon, to which Mr. Cooper alluded. Fiscal year 1999, 2.3 trillion missing. Fiscal year 2000, 1.1 trillion missing. And DOD is the number one reason why the government can't balance its checkbook. The Pentagon has claimed year after year that the reason it can't account for the money is because its computers don't communicate with each other. My second question, Mr. Secretary, is who has the contracts today to make those systems communicate with each other? How long have they had those contracts? And how much have the taxpayers paid for them? Finally, Mr. Secretary, after the last hearing, I thought that my office was promised a written response to my question regarding the four war games on September 11th. I have not yet received that re response but would like for you to respond to the questions that I've put to you today, and then I do expect the written response to my previous question, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, thank you, uh, Representative. First, the answer to your first question is, is no, absolutely not. The policy of the United States government is uh, clear, unambiguous, and opposed to uh, to the activities that you described. The um, second question. Well, how do you explain the fact that um, DynCor and its successor uh, companies have received and continue to receive government contracts? I would have to go and, and find the facts, but there are laws and rules and regulations with respect to government contracts and there are times that corporations do things they should not do, in which case they tend to be suspended for some period. There are times then that, that the, under the laws and the rules and regulations for the, that uh, passed by the Congress and implemented by the executive branch, that corporations can get off of the pen, out of the penalty box, if you will, and, and be permitted to engage in contracts with the government. They're, they're not generally not barred in perpetuity. This contract, this company um, was never in the penalty box. If you could proceed to my second question, please. The, um, the second question, uh, I've forgotten what the second question was. I think Ms. Jonas knows it. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. McKinney. I appreciate the question. I appreciate your interest in uh, our department's financial uh, condition, and uh, we are working very hard on that program. I've just come back uh, recently. This I understand that you're working hard on it, but my question was, who has the contract? How long has that, have they had that contract, there are and how much money have we spent on it? In general, we spend about $20 billion in the department on information technology systems. 
Uh, the, uh, the accounting uh, systems are part of that. I can get you the exact number for the record of what we spend on our current, what we call legacy systems, uh, and those that we're moving toward. And who has the contracts? Uh, that, that would be a multitude of uh, individuals. Could you name them. some, please? Uh, well, I think off the top of the, uh, my head, well, I would rather not. I'd rather provide well, that for the record. That's not privileged information, is it? I, I'm sure it's not. Well, please. And I, we still have time, so please. I would be glad to provide for the record. I don't want to talk from the top of my head and be incorrect. The, um, on your first question, I'm advised by Dr. Chu that it was not the corporation that was engaged in the activities you characterized, but I'm told it was an employee of the corporation. And uh, it was some years ago in the Balkans that that took place. It's my understanding that it continues to take place, and is that, that right? Yes. Well, if you can I'm, give me information to that I'm effect, I'm sure you we will... are interested in all of the information that I have, and I'll be more than happy to provide it to Good. you. Good, thank you. But I would also like to get information from you. Okay. For example, the information We're... that I just requested about who has those contracts. Certainly. Let me uh, assure you're... the gentle lady that uh, we'll make sure that this uh, in exchange of information takes place, and. Uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, if you can get back with us on the DynCorp uh, we, we uh, will, story, uh, we'll uh, get that to the gentlelady. We'll get Thank back, you, Mr. Chairman. We'll get back on both of the first two questions, but uh, the, the Congresswoman has raised the other question twice now, and I'd like to have General Myers respond because you, you mentioned it in the last hearing, and I think it would be helpful to get the answer, even though okay. we're on red, if okay. you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Myers, go right ahead. But I would like to have th the answer in writing as well, as I thought my office was promised. Okay, I don't know about the promise, uh, uh, Congresswoman, but could you repeat the question to make sure I'm answering the right question? This is 9-11 question. The question was, we had four war games going on on September 11th, and the question that I tried to pose before the... Uh, secretary had to go to lunch was um, whether or not the activities of the four war games going on on September 11th actually impaired our ability to, to respond to the attacks. Uh, the answer to the question is no, did not impair our response. In fact, uh, General Eberhardt, who was in the commander of North American Aerospace Defense Command, as he testified in front of the 9-11 Commission, I believe. I believe he told them that it enhanced our ability to respond, given that NORAD didn't have the overall responsibility for responding to the attacks today. That was uh, an FAA responsibility. But they were, uh, they were two CPXs. There was one Department of Justice exercise that didn't have anything to do with the, the other three. And there was an actual operation ongoing because there was some Russian bomber activity up near Alaska. So we Let me ask you this, then. Who was in charge of managing those war games. And, uh, this, this and General, uh, why don't you give the, uh, uh, give the best answer you can here in a short period of time, and we'll, uh, the gentlelady wants to get a written answer anyway, and then we can move on uh, to other The important thing folks. to realize is and North American Aerospace Defense Command was responsible. Uh, these are uh, command post exercises. What that means is all the battle positions that uh, are normally not filled are indeed filled. So it was an easy transition from an exercise into a real-world situation. It actually enhanced the, the response. Otherwise, it would take somewhere between 30 minutes and a couple of hours to fill those positions, those battle spaces, with the, the, the right staff officers. Mr. Chairman, begging your indulgence, was September 11th declared a National Security Special Event Day? I'd have to look back. I do not know. You mean after the fact or before the No because of the activities going on that had been scheduled at the United Nations that day. I'd have to go back and check. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. I thank the gentlelady, the, uh, the chair. Uh, you are listening to off planet radio at off planet radio.com I 
Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of Off Planet Radio. I'm Emily Moyer. I'm here with Randy Moggins, and we have a really cool show for you today. I'm super excited. So I'm not going to waste too much time with a long intro because we only have our guests for an hour and a half. Most of you know her, and if you don't, you should. She's a hero of mine, a truth teller of the highest order, who really walks her talk and has stood up to some of the biggest bullies and war criminals of our time. She's a former congresswoman from Georgia, and all the way from Bangladesh, Cynthia McKinney. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. <laughs> Well, thank you. And after uh, what I've experienced this week, I guess what, not just me, but all of us, I think we're all off planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we've been trying to invite people here for a while. But <laughs> yeah, I yes, think it's, it's kind I of a safe place for us. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think you'll have any problem with uh, people accepting your invitation now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody knows what the heck is going on. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's always been my thing is like, there's what we think is going on and there's what's really going on and they're never the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> never. Yes. Right. Yes. That's what got me into trouble. <laughs> because <laughs> I tried to warn people about what was going on, yep. right? Yeah. And yep. Very few people were ready to accept the reality uh, that they didn't realize that they were experiencing. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, ab absolutely. I mean, that's, I mean, we're, we, we're going to, when the show goes out, there'll be a clip of you standing on the floor in front of Congress, uh, you know, doing your thing. And I love that video because it was so long ago. And I mean, how does yes. it feel to you, especially with all the work that people like George Webb have been doing? You've really been yes. vindicated. You know, you, how do you feel about the fact that all that corruption and all that, you know, humans and sex trafficking and missing money and all of these things that you were speaking about nine to nine, 10 years ago, longer now. I think it's 12 years, 12 years now, 12 it, years ago. Yeah. Now people are finally starting to come around to that and, and, um, it has to feel amazing for you. Well, it's a bit bittersweet, you know, because I went through a lot of, uh, personal, what can I say, you know, um, it was hard yeah. at that time when very few people understood the message or they understood the message, they were not ready to accept what I was yeah. saying. And so, um, you know, I was denigrated on the national, international media, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, the, the, well, it's called soft repression, and I experienced that. So first there's the ridicule, then there's the stigma, and then there's the silencing. And so all of that I experienced, each one of those sort of in progression. And the silencing is why I'm here in Bangladesh now. I couldn't earn a living in the United States. And so, um, you know, since I was honest, I didn't... Uh, leave the Congress with a whole lot of money. And so I have to work for a living like average ordinary folk do. And um, no one would hire me. So that's, that, that made it tough. What made it even tougher was the fact that my reputation um, was sullied across the planet, right? Yeah. And uh, because everybody listens to CNN, everybody listens to Fox. I mean, you know, the U.S. media set the standard, they set the tone, and then generally uh, everybody around the world at least listens to them. Most of them believe them too. And uh, so it was just a small, small circle of people that I was able to withdraw to. Also, I had stalkers. So um, those stalkers were not because they loved me. <laughs> they right. were stalking me because they hated me. Yeah. And so um, I had to deal with that as well. So anyway, now 12 years later, what, how do I feel? I feel that I wish that I hadn't had to give up my job in order to survive, that um, you know, the vindication uh, comes late, but as Dr. King said, the arc of justice is long, but it, it bends toward justice. So now uh, people's eyes are waking up and uh, that feels, it doesn't feel good either because what I was talking about was criminal yeah. theft. Yeah. Um, 
from the taxpayers. I was talking about uh, corporations run amok. I was talking about human trafficking. I was talking about some of the most sordid, ugly things yeah. that could happen to individuals and that were being perpetrated by the U.S. government. I was also talking about vaccines and uh, sweetheart deals between the Pentagon and certain corporations that didn't have any experience. And so, you know, uh, our soldiers were getting sick. Their yeah. children were being born with um, deformities, all kinds of things, because these corporations were getting these sweetheart deals. I could go on and on and on about the things that I discovered. Yeah. And so now I guess you could say I'm glad that the rest of the, that a, a yeah, significant chunk, meant. and I believe this is a critical mass of people have caught up now to the facts. And the work that George Webb is doing is just incredible. Um, you know, maybe he's taken up from his namesake, even though they're not related. Yeah. And um, that's Gary Webb. He's yeah. taken up. And so that's good. That's great. And thank goodness we have the internet and alternative media so yeah. that the alternative media that we used to have, which was, um, you know, like the progressive left media that now we have discovered is also a part yeah. of the Here military, industrial, NGO, uh, <laughs> banking, financial, congressional complex, yeah. and they don't represent us either. No. So let me, that was actually something related to that is exactly why I chose to, yeah. to ask you on when I did. But before I get to that, let me, um, I'll ask you since we went there first, the things how close to the truth? I, I think I know what the answer is, but let's tell people how close to the truth is what George Webb is talking about. How close is he? I think he's within a millimeters distance here. I mean, that kind yes. of thing, the brownstoning and the compromising of, of people in, in Congress and Senate, that's pretty prevalent, isn't it? Yes, yes. And um, uh, I think you're familiar with the. Sabelle Etman's deposition. Yeah, I love And um, so basically, I received a phone call from one of the journalists who used to be uh, alternative, but now has become mainstream, a part of that complex, yeah. that progressive complex. And um, they were asking me, this was before Sybil yeah. did the deposition. And so they were asking me about, was it true? And I think you know what I'm referring to. Yeah. And so I said, well, you know, there's one way to find out. Let's let's actually go and speak to this member of Congress. So I went and I started out uh, with a line like this. I said, you know, I really am upset that the leadership um, forced you to do things that you would not normally do. And then just like clockwork, this member of Congress chimed in and said, yes, I did it because I wanted to get in with the speaker. The speaker at that time was Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. And um, so then I said, well, how does that make you feel? And, and then I was told, uh, I feel used and abused. And I said, absolutely. And yeah. uh, so now, the presumption was that we knew um, what each other was referring to. Right. And then, of course, uh, Sabelle's deposition came out later, and uh, where she actually called names. Uh, I watched as this particular member of Congress went from like a little fireball mm -hmm. to a, um, you know, uh, a protege of the leadership kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, so this is, this is one real experience that I had. But then, of course, I had lots of experiences there. Because, you know... Um, Did anyone uh, try and compromise you? Not that I think you're compromised. Oh, lots of times. Yeah. Lots of times. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, it's just like it never happened. Like, I had people come and they would offer me things. I had one phone call from uh, a now deceased journalist who was part of that complex. 
And he um, asked me, when was I going to get involved on the Sudan issue? Mm -hmm. And I said, I am involved, <laughs> you know, because I'm involved. On, I was at that time, I was involved on all of the human rights issues that, right. that came through my door. If people came through my door and they had a grievance, I did my best to try and get to the bottom of the, the, that grievance. And so, um, uh, so what I did was I offered a bill on Sudan to delist U.S. corporations that were involved in human rights violations. And that was unacceptable because, of course, punishing corporations for the wrongs that they do is unacceptable. So I got the phone call asking me when I was going to get involved with Sudan, but not in that, not right. in that way, right? In the yeah. way that they wanted me to be involved in Sudan. Yeah. This was before Sudan was split. Okay. And so, of course, I know that one of the fundamental tenets of the Organization of African Unity, or now the Organization of African States, is territorial integrity because those boundaries were drawn splitting families. Yeah. And so with no regard to anything except what the European powers wanted. So therefore, if once you start getting into, well, I want this one and I want that little enclave, then the entire edifice would fall. Well, maybe that might be a good thing, but um, so at the time, of the formation of the uh, Organization of African Unity, the idea was that, that we don't want this to happen. We don't want the whole continent to fall apart. And so therefore, our position is territorial integrity. That is not the position of the certain faction of the deep state that right. now everyone is talking about, that now we can see out front and in the open. There, yeah policy is balkanization. It yeah. started with Yugoslavia, when they literally broke Yugoslavia up. And then it went to, um, now it's uh, still on the European continent, it's, it then went to uh, Kosovo and uh, Czech, uh, um, uh, Bosnia. Serbia. Serbia, Bosnia, and, yeah. yeah. Yes, that's right. And uh, now we can see the situation unfolding in Ukraine, still yeah. on the uh, European continent. And then you uh, can go down to Africa and it's everywhere. They succeeded in balkanizing Sudan. And I witnessed two Sudanese girls who um, I had been invited to participate in this Nobel women's program. Yeah. And they invited a, a young girl from uh, South Sudan and another one, another girl from woman, I should say young woman, from um, Sudan. And yeah. they literally cried when, and in their embrace of each other because their country had been torn apart. They were and they friends probably or they were didn't know who had done it or why. Huh. They were friends or they were sisters? No, they they no. they, they just didn't know each other. But oh, okay. their country, and you know, it would be like yeah, me yeah. and you if something happened to the United States. Yes, you know. Yeah. So um, the situation is very bad, and our government is doing this, and mm -hmm. it's doing it in our name with our tax dollars, even though it's you could say, okay, it's the deep state. Nobody was elected or very few of the members of the deep state were elected by the public. There's a public state, according to my right. professor, who served on my dissertation committee. Peter Dale uh, Scott. Who coined the term, yeah. Peter Dale Scott, that's yeah. right. And so he says there's a public state and there's the deep state. And so the public state, sometimes they you know, fit together like this. But generally speaking, most of the people who operate in the deep state, you've never heard of them. And that's why I believe that Steve Bannon is right when, he, yeah. when it comes to the European Union. 
he's right because what happened to the Europeans was that <clears throat> this deep state got together on their continent and said, how can we deny the people their political rights? How can we corral them so that their political behavior is, oh, it, it, uh, becomes acceptable or non-existent? And so the creation of the European Union, I was in Europe at the time, and I remember people saying, we are giving up our identity, we're giving up our, our, our money, we're giving up uh, who we have been for hundreds of years, we're giving that up, uh, and now we don't know what. So anyway, I agree with Nigel Farage. I agree with, today, I agree with Steve Bannon. I don't care what name they call Steve Bannon, he's right on Europe, he's right on Brexit, and so uh, he's right on the regime change wars, he's yep. right on the focus on uh, the need for a focus on the United States, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so uh, therefore, how can I not be for Steve Bannon's presence in the White House? So it's interesting that all of this now unfolds when he's on the rocks. Yeah. I, I mean, this is uh, my feeling about truth and good information. It, it doesn't matter where it comes from if it's truth and good information. That was one of my first big lessons when I started on this truth journey is that sometimes the truth was going to come from, you know, because I, from my family background and from my own personal background, come from the left it, as you do. But mm -hmm. it was really disturbing to me when I first, you know, I really, my wake up really started between 2005, 2008, kind of that time. And what I found, it was really upsetting and hard for me to hear. There, there was a lot more truth coming from the right in some cases. And I had to overcome that. And a lot of people who I still, who I love very much and who are very intelligent still can't overcome that. They want to hear yes. it from someone they like in order to believe it. So I'm hoping yes. that some of these people, um, who they know who are, who I'm speaking to them, they like you. So I'm hoping that they'll, <laughs> they'll accept Well, isn't it interesting? <laughs> isn't it interesting, though? that within 24 hours of the time that Steve Bannon was, shall we say, laterally moved out of a frontline position in Trump's foreign policy, all of a sudden we go into Syria with a missile attack. I don't, That's I don't right. see that as a coincidence at all. And it, it I don't think it's a coincidence either. I agree with you. It feels to me like he was replaced with Jared Kushner, who's the advisor from Israel. <laughs> right? Kind you of. Know, well, the, the thing that's so uh, hurtful is that Jared Kushner is such a lightweight. I mean, I, I'm sorry to have to put it this way, but the position, uh, how can I say, it, it, it's not befitting, Jared Kushner is not befitting of the enormous yeah. weight of the task that lay before yeah. us, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, no, I agree. So let me tell you what happened, which was what inspired me to contact you when I did. So I have a friend who, um, that I was having co coffee with who used to be a reporter for KPFK. And, oh. and she was fired at, when they brought, this was several years back, she was fired when they brought in new management because they didn't like the, the, the story, the, the series of stories she proposed did not fit their agenda. So she was fired. So I was telling her, so I, I said to her, I said, well, of course you don't fit in there. KPFK is a, a, a shill network and they got a lot of shills over there. I said, you know, but this woman who I really like, Cynthia McKinney, I had just found out a few weeks before that. I didn't know you had a show there. I had just found out yes. a few weeks before that. I said, but this woman, Cynthia McKinney, who I really like, She's on the air there. I don't know how that's happening because she's like a total <laughs> truth teller. I said, I, I had to inform this, this person that Amy Goodman wasn't on our side. And she was right. shocked at first. And then when she said, when she really thought about it, she's like, how, how did I not see this before? And so I was telling uh, my friend Danny about you. And, and this literally was in three days of me telling her that story, the thing happened with you at KPFK. So do yeah. you want to tell every, so I thought, so when that happened, I'm like, okay, I have to ask you now. What, tell our listeners what happened to, P, to you at KPFK. Well, it's the strangest thing. 
because um, I didn't solicit KPFK to do a radio show. KPFK solicited me. Right. <laughs> and so um, I said yes. I have been saying yes for uh, uh, no for years because I um, didn't. I didn't want to do radio. It was too much of an investment of time. Yeah. And that show, that show uh, took me about 10 to 12 hours to produce each week. So it was a huge, even more of an investment of time that I expected and anticipated. Yeah. But since I had been asked to do it and I said yes, then I did it. And I did it for probably, I don't know, maybe, maybe a year. Yeah. And then um, just out of the blue, um, there's the, uh, the, the group that asked me to do the show got overthrown, mm -hmm. <laughs> regime change. And this is just what happened style. to my friend, basically, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, then um, I, you know, I literally don't know what happened other than one day I have a show and the next day I don't have a show. I'll tell you That's from, what happened. I'll tell you from my perspective what happened is you were, okay. the way you were talking about things in the period of time right after the election was a way that you were basically saying in, in sometimes so many words and not so many words that the left is no better than the right. That the, so the yes. sycophants yes. are just as bad as the Trump sycophants. And what I yes. noticed about KPFK and Democracy Now! and the left part of the media industrial alternative complex is that they're yes. only interested in the truth when it's about negative things about the right. And they'll occasionally right. see, say something bad about, like, you know, when, about the, the wars and things like that. But they, they never really, you know, they, they don't, I mean, this is what they I didn't think. say much about the wars. They didn't, they didn't say, say they, much about Obama bombing all the over the planet. Anti, the, le the left isn't anti-war anymore. It's it's very weird. Right, that they're not, and and the left isn't even liberal anymore. Um, That's I, right. I, I I like um I don't know if you're familiar with Dave Rubin, but he he calls them the regressive left. I will say, mm. I, I, like, I'll get into sometimes discussions with people, and they'll be like, but the left isn't as bad as the alt-right. And I'm like, no, but the regressive left is exactly the same, but on equal sides as the alt-right. And yes. most people who even say things about the alt-right don't even clearly understand what it is. Because if, right. if they really understood what it was, in some ways it's much worse than they think. And in other ways, they have a point that everybody's failing to, to be honest about. Right. So it's a, it's right. a difficult animal that most people on the left don't haven't even taken any time to understand. But the the you were in a way without saying the exact words that i've been saying you were pointing this out in a way that would make these yeah. people uncomfortable because that's who you are you just say the truth you don't yeah. know wherever it goes and they i think you've been there long enough that they knew you're like you're a really likable person for to a lot so if they can find a way to have you be there then it makes them look like they're presenting truth and you exactly have a, pleasant, you have a pleasant personality but when they you've been there long enough and they'd watch enough of your shows that they knew that there was no way they were going to be able to manipulate you into their kind right. of whatever and that that's what i think what do you think that's right that's right and i agree with you too and so what i basically did or was was forced to do because the language now is so uh, how can I say it's uh, inaccurate because the alt left, the uh, alt right, the progressive, the liberals, the, I mean, I don't know what anything is any longer because everything has been turned upside down. So basically what I did was I took stock of my own values. I said, okay, I consider myself to be a part of the left. What does that mean to me? Who am I? And I'm anti-war, I'm pro-peace, I'm pro-social justice. These things I have to keep reminding myself over and over again. And yeah. so when I see somebody saying that they're progressive, that they're the left, and they're supporting Hillary Clinton, they ain't the left. They're they, not progressive. Yeah, and even, um, in my opinion, even, sorry, Randy, I think you want to say something, go ahead. No, I, I was, I was, I was smiling out loud. 
um, because most most of the people who profess to be liberal Democrats were were really reluctant to admit the fact that Hillary Clinton was the biggest neocon in Washington D.C. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. You know the policies yes. that she pursued in the State Department with Obama were some of the most aggressive nation building and empire wrecking we've seen in modern politics. Yeah. Yes. And, and I would even say that Bernie Sanders isn't even really on the left the way you and I would consider it. Bernie Sanders talks a good talk, but when you, you know, when you try to match his actions to his words, uh, we have a problem. Something smells. Well, we do have a problem. Yeah. He, he endorsed Hillary. Yeah. That's and the big, so, yeah. you know, yeah. that, that, <clears throat> aside from the fact that um, Bernie had voted to support all of the wars. All of the wars. Exactly. If, you, exactly. if you look at the those pieces of legislation, and most of them were passed with unanimous consent, meaning that there was not one objection. Uh, yeah. The moment you object, then you've got to have a debate, and you got to, you know you have a you don't have to have a recorded vote, but that normally would follow the debate is a recorded vote. But a lot of those uh, pro-Israel yep. uh, bombing Gaza resolutions passed with unanimous consent. That yeah. means that Bernie supported those bills. Okay, so that, that was a problem that I had in the beginning. But Bernie, I believe, rose to the occasion. I saw him grow mm -hmm. as a candidate. And uh, yeah. that was a candidate that I felt would be good for the United States under his leadership. Um, the way he distanced himself, himself from APAC, the way he, 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 um, he really never paid any attention. You know, his constituents, his black constituents came out and said, well, he doesn't even know we exist. Yeah. And, so, you know, the, the way that he began to understand that there was more analysis that needed to be done than just his class analysis, um, the, I saw him grow, but then he rolled over. Rolled he over. rolled over in such a way that made me believe, uh, and then of course that belief was reinforced when the WikiLeaks uh, Clinton emails came out and they said, hey, he's getting off, off, um, off the reservation. You better pull him back in. You remember that email? Yeah. Yeah. And so then I said, okay, this is a part of the game. I understand that Obama was part of the game, but um, yes. yep. uh, Bernie was probably a part of the game from the very beginning. And that's why they say that we need to bring him back on the reservation. So they brought him back and sh true to form, instead of bolting the Democratic Party, because you know, what, heck, he's not yeah. a Democrat anyway, right? You know, right. he's independent. And so they stole, he, and they stole of, the primary from him. Exactly. So, <laughs> you know, he can, he can yeah. go, he can, he can go to unite the other uh, uh, independent parties. At, at least that was my hope that there would be some kind of fusion candidacy yep. where the Greens would endorse him, yep. the, libertar the, the Libertarians you know, would. In some ways, I felt like Sanders had the ability there for a while to galvanize all these disparate factions and pull them together yes. and present a meaningful he could have put opposition together a to party. Donald Trump. He could have put a coalition party together yes, between the Greens, the, the Libertarians, and the Constitution Party or something like that. Yes, and, yes. And, and yes. that would very easily have been Trump. And the fact that he didn't do, it didn't, I mean, he never even said anything when it became evident that the election was stolen from him. He, so either he was threatened or blackmailed, or in my opinion, yes. this was all part of the plan. I see it as when, you, when they present these kinds of candidates, the idea is to let the people, it's like an esteem valve, let the people feel like someone's hearing them and then have that yes. person roll them back into, same thing with Ron Paul in the last election, present the esteem valve yes. and then have them roll them back into the Republican or the Democratic Party. 
And yes, yes. That's it, right? As being someone who has been on the other side of that table, because, you know, my father uh, practiced politics a lot, and, you know, was a member of the Georgia legislature, and uh, did a lot of this uh, kind of stuff, you know. He, I, I've, seen it, I've, I've seen it from the inside where you recruit somebody to run. Um, uh, they, 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 if, they, if they win, it's a bonus, but it's not, you know, actually for them to win. It's just right. for them to be a name on the ballot, to attract uh, votes, to siphon show up horse. votes. Basically to, you know, a show horse candidate that goes out there. Yes, and, and, exactly. And has a exactly. Slot. Yeah. And, yes, and also, that's right. And also, I think the other thing that you didn't fit in, but also this thing that's going on, a lot of people around me who are lefties, they buy into this idea that everyone who voted for Trump is a racist. And that's just not true. Yeah. Like a lot, a lot of the same people that voted for Trump voted for Obama. And they didn't, were not yes. happy with what they got for Obama. Lots of people were just, you know, I, I think a very small percentage of people were really excited about Trump as a candidate. Most people were just wanting something different, wanting something not Washington, and were tired yes. of the eight years of what Obama had. And so this idea that anybody who voted for Trump is like a racist and a homophobe or a xenophobe or any of those things, it's not true, is it? No, it's not true. In fact, um, uh, I have a friend who's like on the Marxist side, you know, he, yeah. you know he's like there. And um, he does independent radio. So he went to uh, Cleveland Mm -hmm. to talk to, actually, he wanted me to go there as well, but my tentacles weren't deep enough into the right side of the movement. Now, of course, they are a little bit deeper, but um, he, he went there for the express purpose of, of getting to know the Trump voter. Yeah. What he came back with was, he said, my goodness, all you have to do is ride through Cleveland to understand why people are upset yeah. with the status quo, why people are upset with what is going on, the economic policies going on in the United States, because the, the Rust Belt is truly rusty. It's yeah. rusted out. It's empty to the core, and people have been dispossessed of everything, including their dignity. There's dignity in work, and people have been dispossessed of their dignity. They can't afford to send their children to school. They can't afford to go back to school because education has become a profit center. And so therefore, you can't afford it any longer. And so um, he talked to them. And guess what they told him? They told him that if um, uh, Trump didn't make it, their next stop was Bernie. So these yeah. are not racist. These right. are people who have been hurt. Yeah. They've been hurt. But now some of us, you know, so I'm very quick to say, okay, some of us have been hurt from day one, right? right. And what I have always tried to say is stop the hurt over here. Stop the hurt in my community so it doesn't travel to your community. Stop yeah. the hurt. And it didn't happen. And so... Then we also saw that the chairs is like a game of musical chairs. This was back in 2008. There's an economist who did some investigation. <clears throat> He's from Malaysia. And I can't remember his name. But he looked at who were the icons of finance before 2008 and who the icons of finance in the United States were after 2008. And so basically what ha happened was the economic deep state changed hands. You could say that they played a game of musical chairs. Yeah. And so uh, there the used to be a gang that was in charge and then a new gang came along, took the chairs from them and occupied the seats. This new gang, didn't care about anybody except themselves. Right. And so this new game then spread the hurt to everybody. Yeah. And nobody was shielded. So this, <clears throat> this is, that new game is basically the new game uh, that I was trying to describe 
right. was a particularly pernicious um, set of individuals that were criminal back uh, in, in 2000 or let me see 2000 when Mike Rupert was in my office and uh, some people were carrying carrying a sign I can't remember now it was something about the criminals taking taking the government or whatever and right. I took that sign and then Mike Rupert did an interview with me and I said a criminal syndicate has taken over our government I did not understand how true that really was yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I don't think our government was really any more criminal. I mean, it, it, you'd think it had reached the height of criminality under Bush, but oh, the height of right. criminality was exceeded under Obama. That's um, right. I want That's to go back right. to one more thing you said a few minutes ago, and you said that you were for social justice. I'm for social justice, too. But would you agree with me, this kind of social justice that this AstroTurf left social justice warrior movement thing is having, that's not that they're kind of demanding. That isn't real social justice. This stuff that George Soros is funding and whatnot. Would you agree with me? Can you explain that to people, the difference between what's being presented as social justice and what real social justice is? I, what, what I, the, the reason I took myself through this values inventory yeah. was because I <clears throat> wanted to make sure that I stayed on my path and that yeah. I wasn't swayed by um, what I heard in the media. So mm -hmm. that what I always ask people to do is to follow principle, mm -hmm. not personalities. Yeah. And so once you get involved in following personalities and forget about the principles that's where the trouble begins because personalities can be purchased yeah personalities can let us down they can let the principles that they espouse they don't even have to live by those principles right. so we need to be very clear about what our principles and our values are <clears throat> so when George Soros comes along and he says that Black Lives Matter now because I'm willing to put a million dollars behind Black Lives Matter, does that mean that Black Lives didn't matter before? Or uh, it seems to me that Black Lives didn't matter until George Soros said Black Lives Matter. Wow. So um, this is exactly a replay of the Arab Spring. And so you could say exactly that people right. have been trying right. to do a US Spring, right? Those same deep state yeah. players, Another color they right. want a US Basically. Spring. Yeah. And George Soros funds all those other ones, so of course he would fund this one too. Absolutely. And so, but, but you see, here's the, here's the point that I've been trying to make literally all of my political career. And that is those people who are dissatisfied with the system, see if, or the practice of politics, see if there's some way that you can meaningfully engage that dissatisfaction. If you meaningfully engage that dissatisfaction and allow those groups to participate, give them a role that is a significant role that is defined by them. Then mm. when the George Soros money begins to flow, it doesn't really matter because they have, it has no place to go. But yeah. you've got the balkanization of the US electorate and so you've got young people, you've got environmentalists, you've got women, you've got transgender, you've got, so you balkanized into all these different groups. And so what happened to the principles? Yeah. What happened to <clears throat> you are my brother? What yeah. happened to us talking to each other and engaging each other with dignity? What happened to that? Yeah. So, um, as long as you can lock in these uh, uh, 
mm. balkanized entities, what um, uh, Gilad Atzman, I wrote I the, him. yeah, I, love uh, I, I don't know if it's the, well, he's, he's got a new book yeah. that's coming out. And about the book is called politics, being, right? it's about identity uh, being politics, in time. Right? Yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So he starts the book uh, from the back. <laughs> so it's like the, the, uh, like anyway, the whatever goes at the end, the afterward yeah. is in the front. Yeah. So instead of me writing the preface, I called it the postscript because it's like afterwards, right? Yeah. So I wrote the postscript. And basically, he's, he's right. He says that those people who are um, experts at divide and conquer, those people have become expert at dividing the U.S. polity in such a way that they always remain on the top. That's, exa that, that's exactly right. That was going to be my, my very next question for you was going to be, you've spoken a lot in the past about COINTELPRO and how they've yes. infiltrated, you know, the Black, the Black Panther movement, the Patriot movement at times. Yes. Right? My the question, American right? Indian movement, all, all of that. the so-called movements that right. they were penetrating. So here's my question for you. Is the alt-right and the kind of social justice warrior movements like Black Lives Matter and others, the modern day iteration of what used to be COINTELPRO infiltration of a group, but now they just create it through foundations and NGOs. And so instead of infiltrating, they're creating. Do you think that that's a close assessment of what's a close, pretty close to what's going on here? Do you? Well, you know, uh, yeah, there's a lot of creating going on. Yeah, And of course, for those of us who studied repression and this uh, phenomenon of soft repression, the corporate, the, the um, how can I say the, uh, not corporate, but the foundation funding mechanism mm -hmm. is also a mechanism that fosters suppression yep. because groups and organizations are not allowed to pursue perhaps uh, agendas that they would like to pursue, but instead are channeled into certain behaviors in order to keep the dollars flowing. Yep. So basically what happens is you go with the money or you go with your conscience. Yeah. And many of us, we've decided that we would go with our consciences. And so we have no money. <laughs> and that's so okay. we have no money. That's and right. So, and also, don't you see elements of what's going on in this kind of divide? C could this be the Gladio coming home, like Sibel has always talked about? Are we, are we looking at Gladio C here in the United States? Well, absolutely. One of the lessons from the COINTELPRO papers and the Frank Church Committee and its deliberations was that if the deep state policymakers would take a policy of, say, assassination abroad, then they would bring it home, right. which they did. Yeah. And so everything that the U.S. state has done abroad, it has also done at home. From uh, the research that, thank goodness, uh, Antioch University, uh, the Ph.D. program allowed me to delve a little bit deeper into the COINTELPRO issue because that was something that I was truly moved by. Yeah. Um, one, there's not nearly enough research on COINTELPRO, by the way, nope. which <laughs> tells me that academia is part of that complex, that military, industrial, banking, financial, media, yep. academia complex, yeah. right? And, and so, um, but one, a study that was done by Bruce Cunningham found that the FBI did certain, ran certain plays over and over again. I liken it to football. Yeah. Um, so there was a draw play, a screen pass, a Hail Mary, um, a quarterback sneak. And so each one of those plays was done over and over again because they were successful. So, um, some of us who have studied this then can see the formation 
So yes. when you recognize the formation, you read the defense, you, 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 well, you read the offense if you're the defensive player, you yes. read the offense and then you know what's going so you can position yourself accordingly. Yes. Unfortunately, <laughs> the rest of the people in the stands haven't caught up yet to the coaches who understand that this is gonna be a screenplay. So when you need them to lift their voices and yell and make it in, you know, it impossible for the audible to be called, yeah. um, they don't raise their voice yeah. and leave you out there, uh, you know, in, in the lurch. But the behavior of the US government is just like that. It runs the same place over and over again. And so now, uh, we know the role of George Soros. We know the role of these created organizations. We yeah. know the impact that disgruntled citizens have when somebody then is ready to put the, a million dollars behind them. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, they become a spring. Yeah. Wow. Great, great, also, amazing. on the uh, George Soros thing, um, I've looked at the photos of the ships that are funded by the network of Soros NGOs that are taking the migrants from Africa and Asia to Europe. Yeah. And it looks like slave ships. Wow. They look like slaves mm. yep. from the transatlantic slave trade wow that's what, what it looks like if you have and if this you have, is a very sad situation yeah. Yeah. that we are allowing this to happen in this way and so now you know i'm the first one to criticize to criticize europe because europe went around the world and destroyed through colonialism destroyed the lifestyle of other people conquered them, manipulated them, divided them, and did everything. So colonialism, neo-colonialism, uh, this, uh, we first have to even deal as colonized people with the fact that our minds have been colonized as well. Totally. And so we have so much decolonizing that needs to be done. We must learn the lessons from Franz Fanon who said that the attitude of presumed inferiority is as pernicious as the attitude of presumed superiority, right? Yeah. And so both sides were effect, uh, affected by the colonial contact that continues to live with us yeah. 400, 500 years later. That still, in no way justifies you're gonna destroy Africa and Asia and then ship those people for your own purposes mm -hmm. to into Europe for your own purposes. Now I've called this something and um, it looks to me like the Samson option. Mm -hmm. And I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar with the Samson option. Yeah. I, I, we but, are, but mm -hmm. go ahead and tell okay. everybody. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Seymour Hirsch wrote a book by that same name. And once I read the book, once I started reading the book, I couldn't put it down, right? Because my experience conforms to what the history, which is the historical narrative of the uh divide and rule, manipulation, deception, um, even uh, cultural invasion. Mm -hmm. These are the mechanisms of oppression given to us by Paulo Freire. And um, uh, Seymour Hirsch describes how Israel rushed to become a nuclear state. Mm -hmm. And they used all of these mechanisms in order to achieve their goal, which of course they did. And so now because of Jimmy Carter and Mordecai Benunu, we know that the Israelis have nope. 300 or more 
nuclear weapons, probably a whole lot more. Some of which they've stolen, um, we some know. Of which they've stolen from this country, right? Some, which, some of which they've stolen from the United States. That's right. That's right. And um, we, we also know that they have nuclear triads. So they are as powerful. They can deliver from air, land, and sea, just like the United States. And so um, the, the, now when President Kennedy was challenging Israel's presumed right to become a nuclear state, um, the Israelis decided that they would retaliate. And this retaliation plan is called the Samson option. The retaliation would take place in Washington, D.C., Paris, London, um, Moscow. And so the Samson option is to destroy those capitals of those countries that would dare to destroy Israel. And so the Samson option. So now, in my opinion, what we're witnessing is a combination of two theories that have been put forward. One is cliodynamics, which is a theory put forward by Dr. Peter Turchin at the University of Connecticut. Basically, he says in boom periods, the deep state or the aspirants to the deep state grows, that their number grows. And so there's so many of them who become wealthy and think that then they deserve a, 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 a shot at calling the shots. Right. Um, but there's only a limited number of positional places available for them to occupy. So then you have one faction fighting another faction of the deep state. So that's what we've seen. The old faction, remember the, the uh, research that found that the um, economic deep state players changed in 2008. That right. was like a coup in and of itself. But we didn't recognize that. Right. So then um, now you've got these other people who have been working together, but all of a sudden they say, uh, we deserve this. And then you've got the others who say, well, uh, you can't have it all. And so then you start, they start fighting each other. That's what we think. Right. But here's the thing. One of those factions, one of those deep state factions is willing to destroy the world if they don't get their way. Yeah. And so now you've got a, a, the, the added phenomenon of not just two colossal players duking it out and we're just trying to duck and run and hope that we don't get stepped on by them. But now you've got one faction that actually has the power to destroy the planet. Right. And they're crazy enough to <laughs> actually use their power. What and, do you do? That's the Samson option. And, and, how, and how does this, what we're seeing, the bringing people in from Africa and Asia to Europe and to the United States on slave ships, well, how does that play into it? Well, because there's many ways to destroy your yeah. enemy, isn't there? Yeah. And so um, you can destroy. So basically what they've done is they weaponized human pain. Yeah. They inflict the pain by way of U.S. policy. And then they weaponize the only the only way that people seek to relieve themselves of yeah. the pain yeah so the, they they can inflict pain on people pain on people and then they bring those people to the countries that inflicted the, inflicted the pain and and then the people will wonder why there's problems would you agree with me that this idea like that oh you, and wait a minute i'm sorry let no, me add fine. this and the true hand of the player inside the deep state who's manipulating all of this is never shown. Never shown. So people not. take their animus out, out. Yeah. against Muslims. 
Yeah. Migrants, yeah. Latinos. Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. Anything exactly. Yeah. except where the, uh, you know, I tell people, you're focused on powerless people. Focus yeah. on those who are running the Federal Reserve. Yeah. I mean, focus on the people who have the power. Don't focus on this yeah. person who's as yeah. much a victim as you are. A absolutely. I always say, isn't it a false choice? Like when, you know, pe people always want to say, oh, you're a horrible person if you're against immigration. You're a wonderful person if you're for, they make it that, isn't that really a false choice? Isn't the answer really, wait, how come nobody ever discusses, how about we stop bombing their country so we don't even have to exactly. get to that argument? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you see, that's the point yeah. at which both parts of the deep state used to agree. Yeah. It's all right for us to bomb those countries. Yeah. But now you, you've got enter Donald Trump. He's not saying anything any different, or when he was campaigning, he's not saying anything any different than I was saying. He's not right. saying anything any different than you were saying. Yeah. Stop the regime change wars. Focus on the people. My dad asked the question, what does Tel Aviv have to do with Stone Mountain, Georgia? <laughs> but the problem is, it has everything to do with Stone Mountain, Georgia, because I cannot love Stone Mountain, Georgia before or more than I love Tel Aviv. I got to love Tel Aviv first or else I can't walk through the doors of Congress and take the oath that I'm going to protect and defend the people of the United States. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I, you, that's another thing you've spoken out about for a long time. And really one of the only people who've spoken about it the, to the level you have as well was James Traficant. And he was uh, totally, <laughs> totally right. paid the price for that too. He paid the price. He paid the price. And Paul Finley is still alive. He's very ill now. But, yeah. Um, he paid the price. Gus Savage paid the price. He recently died. I think uh, it was in December now of last year that he died. And so there have been many members of Congress who paid the price. Yeah. Thank goodness I, I paid the price, I guess at a young enough age and I was too honest. They tried to put me in prison. They tried to accuse me of, uh, of criminal behavior uh, through the FEC. They use, every, they use everything they can get to you. The, recently, they even try to trick you because I, I was given the opportunity to do a fabulous project uh, on Patrice Lumumba, the U.S. murder of yeah. Patrice Lumumba. And um, they were going to, the, the uh, project was to enlist the assistance of activists around the world. And I couldn't see it. I literally could not see that it was a trick. Yeah. But they were going to pay a huge budget, half a million dollars approximately, in order to do the project. Only later did I find out that, you know, and I, and I, should, I was drawn to the project because it was a good project. It was an opportunity for, for um, uh, activists to actually make some money for a change. To, and, and, but it was from a government that's totally in the grips of George Soros. That part as a government, I never supported, I never, so I thought it was unusual that they would come to me, right. but you know, uh, but the project itself was so attractive. I said, yes, of course. And only later did I discover that, you know, it was Soros and Hillary Clinton, they're working together. <laughs> and um, this is a way, it's, it's, this is how they co-opt you. So yeah. then you take the money, and then you can't uh, criticize, right? Yeah. And so, well, you could, but then, you know, your criticism is um, uh, looked at suspiciously because, you know, you took the money. So thank goodness I didn't take the money. I was, I, I did, I, I called a friend of mine who I was going to um, enlist in the project and he said, Cynthia, I see this all about you getting involved with Congo. What's going on with that government? And I, I, I had never supported that government, right? 
but the project was so good. And so um, then he said, it's still those people. And yeah. when he pointed it out to me, then I went back to the governor. And I said, who's, who's behind this? And then they admitted that it was Hillary Clinton. <laughs> she was and, trying uh, to trick George you. She still, they're still they trying, trying to trick, trick me. You. They're still they trying, trying to trick, to trick you. me. <laughs> yeah, wow. Randy, did you have some questions? I know you had some questions for Cynthia. No, you know what I have right now is just this. I'm sitting here. I feel like a kid in a classroom just enjoying. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's go here for a minute. Cynthia, you came up through the times, probably like me, the post-civil rights era, the era, what I consider to be the high benchmark of yeah. liberal, true liberalism. Yes. We, we saw a small, I voted, the only president I've ever felt good about voting for was Jimmy Carter. And I have yes. to say that, you know, sadly, he was compromised. He was under, yes. undermined. And only in recent years, I think, has he sort of validated the role of a senior statesman in, 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 in a very elegant way for the most part. But that, that post-Vietnam, post the, the death of Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy, and what spiraled out of control at the end of the Vietnam War sort of yes. felt to me like the left lost its anchoring and drifted off into faction somewhere. From your standpoint, is there still a pulse left in what we would consider classic liberalism or has that been eclipsed by this radical version that now marauds through our streets? I do believe that it's there. The problem, in fact, I found a lot of those people in 2008, uh, yeah. a lot of them just dropped out, mm -hmm. um, went to California, Northern California. And um, I mean, I found my brothers and sisters there, um, which was really gratifying to me that I could, I could meet with people and not have to explain anything, you know, it's just that, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I, I understand. I mean, I understand. Um, but um, so to the extent that the idealists of the 1960s and 70s are still with us is the extent to which um, some legitimate movement can be uh, resurrected. But you see the manipulation that has since taken place is so diabolical mm. because now support for Hillary Clinton and the Democrats is equated with being progressive totally. and that's they the last thing. It. They, they completely co-opted it. Right yes. under our noses and it, was all, it wasn't even co-opted. They swapped it out. They gave yes. you a neocon who very adroitly was able to drop in selective liberal issues at key times, namely women, gays, and selectively the plight of the black people in the inner cities but doing it at the same time that she's taking money from foreign governments, George Soros, Goldman Sachs, and all of the other power brokers that sit on the top rungs of this pyramid that you're talking about. Well, Hillary Clinton, <clears throat> to me, represents the clear and present danger mm, yeah. to the U.S. Yeah. And that's why under no circumstance would it have been possible for me to support Hillary Clinton's <laughs> uh, ascension into the White House. So yes, I, um, fought against that candidacy, you could say with every fiber of my being. Mm -hmm. um, and 
not only are the policies anathema to social justice loving, peace loving people, but she and her family are corrupt as all get out. Oh yeah. I've oh, yeah. never seen <laughs> the level of corruption. Yeah. And to reward that corruption with the White House was the ultimate political sin in my estimation. I agree with you. So I adopted a, 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 a slogan which was used against me, actually, ABC, anybody but Cynthia. Well, you know, if it works, use it again. Right. So, <laughs> so uh, that was the Republicans and the Democrats in the, on the sly uh, supported that campaign, a ABC, anybody but Cynthia. So I say anybody but Clinton. Yeah, no. And encouraged people of all political persuasions, vote your conscience, ABC, anybody but Clinton. <laughs> and so basically what you have are those people who are the direct recipients of the Democratic Party largesse. They are feeding at the trough. Mm -hmm. So that level of support. Those are the piggies that, that, uh, that Catherine Austin Fitz talks about, right? The piggies. The piggies. The trough. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. The piggies. Yeah. And then the other level of support are those people who are still so blind, they're blinded by political party tribalism that they are not able to rise above their yeah. political ethnicity to see what's good for the entire polity. Yeah. Given now, what has occurred in the last three days, the aftermath of the bombings in Syria. And the barometers are out there, but it looks like a lot of people are now going, what did we really get in the bargain for moving our support to Donald Trump? And I can tell you that a fair amount of the people that we're talking about, the people who idealistically, somewhat on the liberal side of things, hoping beyond hope that Donald Trump could rebalance the system somehow. Now look at this, and they recognize this was the policy put forward by Obama in 2013. The American people snap back on that. But we've seen the policies of <clears throat> Obama and the Clinton State Department now suddenly, pardon the term, blow up in our face when Mr. Trump serotypically just goes out and launches those, those attacks into Syria. So the question becomes now, were we given another devil's deal? Was the Hegelian dialectic being exploited against us? We were, yeah, was this the plan all along? You know, because you can't, I mean, you definitely don't want Hillary Clinton, but you can't trust Donald Trump either. I mean, that's for sure, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, th th that's the position. And so uh, now I, I am hoping that Steve Bannon can regain some policy ascendancy here and um, uh, that the pronouncements that were made during the campaign can be brought back. Yeah. Um, I would like to see more action and here's the thing, though. You're not going to see it from this crowd. That's the problem. He's got a bunch of neophytes. Either they're neophytes, they don't understand government. They don't understand governance. And this is something that I've been talking about for a very long time. And I said on my Twitter, uh, Twitter uh, page from day one, I said, okay, I'm sorry, but ethics is a problem here. Mm -hmm. And I've been borne out. You, you, there's a different set of ethics that's involved in governance than what one practices in a private corporation. Right. Yeah. So in a private corporation, you know, it's almost anything goes because very little of that is going to be seen or known by the public. All they will see is the deal that's made at the end. You can hire your family. You can uh, hire the incompetent. Yeah. Uh, you can put them, you know, 
Government is not like that. Do you and think that it, go ahead. Go ahead. Do you think though that, you know, we know that we've been dealing with a corporate government for a long time, but do you think putting someone like Trump in is the final steps in just putting it out there in the open that our government is a corporation and not really a government? Well, um, I know that, that that language has certain meaning, yeah. except that I haven't gotten into that meaning yet. Yeah. So I know that, that there's something behind that. I haven't gotten to the behind that yet. Yeah. But um, what I can say is that uh, early on, you, you know, there was, there was a point in the campaign when um, <clears throat> I sent a message through various surreptitious means to Trump to not cede certain ground to Hillary Clinton, that in effect, he should stand his ground on every issue. Of course, what happened was that he did that for a minute, uh, a minute that went by so fast in the blink of an eye. <laughs> uh, and, you know, but it was done nonetheless. And so that was good. However, uh, it is possible, you know, when I, 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 I want to say this, when Janet Napolitano said that we should be afraid of militia people, mm -hmm. that uh, we should be afraid of white men with guns. Okay, uh, when the moment she said that, I said, mm-hmm, they don't want us to talk to white men with guns, right? Right. So let me go find me some white men with some guns <laughs> so I can talk to them. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, yeah. who is Janet Napolitano to tell me? I I'm from the South. <laughs> I know white men with guns and pickup yeah. trucks, right? right? I know that culture. So I'm not afraid of that culture, especially when we've got a government that's gone rogue that's actually killing people. Yeah. So, well, they're um, sort of playing on the stereotype that goes yes. even back to the 60s. I mean, you know, the white guys with guns were the people that were going out and taking out blacks and, and, and doing all the things that they did to them. And, that, and it's, you're, you're only two steps away from a white sheet and a burning cross at that point. But that's really yeah. the stereotype they're playing on. And when I looked yes. at the Trump campaign, the only hopeful thing I saw was the coalition that reached out across the Great Divide. The black people, the white people, the rednecks, the, the, the yuppie businessmen, all these people for a moment at least seem to have found a common center of gravity. Now, there again- There was another I, moment. Go ahead. Oh, there was another moment too when that happened. Um, and that was the very beginning of the Tea Party. You yeah, remember the, yeah. the, the very beginning yes, right. yeah. when they said, we're not Democrat, we're not Republican, we're independent. Yeah. But then, of course, uh, that off. nickel, nickel um, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, it, it, he swooped um, yeah, I know who you're talking Sarah about. Palin in there, and then, you know, everything was gone after that. Oh, but yeah. at a moment, at the very inception of the Tea Party, um, they also were independent. So mm -hmm. here's the thing. The only way the United States is going to survive and we overthrow the deep state, the current wielders of power in the deep state, is for us to do what they don't want us to do. And that is Amen. for us to come Amen. together. For, us to, talk, for yes. us to talk to each other. This is what I yeah. That's right. For me, That's I, right. I, I come from a more peaceful anarchist voluntarist perspective but not in like a let's have an overthrow revolution i feel like we need to find a way to communicate with each other start solving our problems outside of government and just make them irrelevant 
we are so much better at solving our problems together than we are at being divided and letting some piggies try and pretend to solve our problems for us. I, 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 I like that. Um, and my son is an anarchist um, and he's doing uh, fabulous things uh, in, to uh, get rid of food deserts in Washington, D.C. over in Anacostia. I don't know if you know anything about uh, D.C., but he's into yeah. uh, community. He's a trained lawyer, but he doesn't do law. He does gardening. Okay. He's farming. So I, I anyway, yeah. maybe, maybe, yeah, we'll talk to your, so, maybe we'll talk to your son sometime. Yeah, really. I was just oh, you uh, must. say that. I you must, it yeah. sounds like we need to talk to him. Yes. We, we've had, yes, yes. We've had, we've had Derek Bros on the program. Are you familiar with Derek Bros? No. Yeah. He, he does. He's a voluntarist guy who does community gardening and he started this thing called freedom cells. And it's basically about oh. people coming together in groups and learning to the smaller groups and kind of learning to take care of all their needs together and then starting yes. other groups and the whole thing is just like let's build a parallel system without government and then yes you know and then you know so if whether we one day we get to the point where we don't have government or whether we do we're solving our problems without them so we don't need them kind of yes thing. and you know what uh, that's actually the strategy that's being employed now in Venezuela. Yeah, I did my dissertation on Venezuela. Venezuela, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, that, that's what they are doing. And uh, they call them quilombos, which is the, um, the, the, the word that was used to describe, you know who the Maroons were. The Maroons were the people, the Africans who escaped slavery. So they would go up into the mountains and, and they would form whole societies there. And these were traditional African socialist societies. So now, because Venezuela is under such attack from the US in terms of policy, yeah. the people have started to form these cities that they call Colombos that academics are calling socialist cities. And so they're building the structures so that they don't need the government if they lose the government. But now here's my thing about, um, about that. There's, for as long as there's a presidency, then we need to fight to put our person in it. For as long as there's a Congress, we need to fight to put our people in it. So I would say, yes, let's do this. And at the same time, let's also fight for um, that state power, if we can get it. So I guess for myself, I, the last time, you know, I found out about you about two weeks after the 2008 election. So the last time okay. I ever voted, the last time I ever voted was for Barack Obama. And I, I never, I, that, I, after that, I would never be tricked again. And I choose not to vote because I see voting as consent to a system that I have not agreed to. That doesn't mean I, I'm not willing to work with people who still believe in government. We can work on things that we, I don't believe in it. I see it as a religion. And I see, this is what I, I was, you know, if government, in my opinion, were actually truly designed to work for the people, then you'd be president, right? I mean, you would still, still be in Congress. But to me, you're yeah. the best example of, of, the, of the fact, of the, you know, the best example of the fact that government is not there to help the people. Government is there to legitimize corporations doing whatever they want to the people because the, co the corporations, you know, we, we, whether people, people are afraid we're going to have fascism now under Donald Trump, we've been having fascism for a really long yeah. time already. They call it a right. public-private partnership. They make it sound like very friendly and nice, but where I come from, that's still fascism. And I see the government as being, at this point, nothing more than a, like a legitimization process for corporations and, and industrial complexes to have their way with the people. On that note, Randy, I know you had one specific question you wanted to ask Cynthia about before we wrap it up. You, but what, do you remember what it was? Because I, I do, I do. Okay, well then, I to ask her if she knew Emily anything. is now going to ask my question because I forgot it. <laughs> Randy had a long weekend. He was at the For Your Mind conference over the weekend. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so, Randy wanted to ask you if you knew anything about the suppression of free energy technology. Yeah, that's right. Oh, well, so no, person. I don't. Except that I've even tweeted out some um, 
free energy technologies that have been profiled in mm -hmm. regular uh, magazines and yeah. um, uh, uh, and um, so what I'm trying to say so uh, it, it hasn't been exploited I guess I, I, I don't know if exploit is the right word or not but it, it's not being promoted Right. So th that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's something that I could get behind because I think that the, how can I say, scientific um, expertise that's out there is so much more wondrous and available than well, it has been just suppressed. scratch has the been, surface. Yeah, I mean, it has been suppressed. I've seen the technology. Yeah. And Okay. Um, where I'm coming from with this is that I don't think as a civilization we can move forward. We can't go back. Our, our, we, we, we live in a technological age and it's some people's terror and some people's fantasy that we move ourselves back to a pre-technological time. That's not reality. What is reality is that the front-end technology that we have now is out stripping the infrastructure that supports it. And there is in fact a very viable market out there that sits in the underground waiting to be released to the people. And I've talked to the inventors, I've talked to the corporate people who have developed it, I've talked to activists, and the only thing that's missing right now is the political will to unstrap yeah. ourselves from big oil from the large yes. energy interests that control us, they literally have us by our scalp. Yes. And, yes. you know, I think, I think for someone like you to be able to get behind this and, and begin to push that would, you know, it's, it's, it would be meaningful in, in a way. I, I don't think I can completely articulate this. It was, it's one of my burning issues. And I think both of ours, yeah. Yeah, I, I think this is one of the ways we move forward. If we can build in the free market a method to liberate ourselves from big oil, I think we yes. go a long way towards not only destabilizing the deep state, but also reinstalling a legitimate, viable government again. Yes, and we desperately need a legitimate, viable government again. We do. <laughs> so, um, to the extent that um, now we, you know, we've crossed the divide here because um, this is our first time uh, chatting with each other, it's yeah. first time getting to know each other, but um, we found common ground here. And I can tell you that I found common ground on too many issues with too many people who are supposed to be like my polar opposite. So that on my radio program, I'm going to have some Montana mountain people, you know, and uh, we, th there's the Red Pill Expo that's coming out. So, and people like me, even though I won't be able to be there because it's in Montana and it's a long way away, but <laughs> I won't be able to go there. But yeah. people like James Corbett and um, oh, yeah. Catherine Austin, other people are, you know, and so um, now is our time, I think. Now yeah. is our time. And you're talking about free energy. Now is our time. So uh, I, I know that that kind of uh, energy exists. I don't know how to explain it. Uh, I don't know that I have to know how to explain you don't, you don't. it. I just have to know that it exists and then go out there and uh, uh, spread the good news to the world. Yeah. That's right. That's right. All right. So before we go, do you have anything else you want to say? And then I'll wrap it up, Randy. No, actually, um, I'm, I'm very fulfilled. This has been marvelous. So Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us. Um, one of the things I've really learned on my truth journey is how important it is for us to act with personal integrity in everything that we do. Yes, that's right. I consider you a great role model for myself and for everybody else who's on this journey with us that we have to make the change with ourselves, even if that means we have to make hard choices, live without money, do all yes. of these things. Yes. Um, yes. We have to change our, we have to be in line with ourselves before we can enact change in the world. And you're a great that's example right. of that. And we really appreciate you. And you're welcome to join us off planet anytime you want. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's <laughs> Thank you, Emily and Randy. Thank you.
All right. Thank you so much. Hang on for just a second. All right. Yeah. And okay. Recording. That's going to wrap it up for this time. This is Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins with Emily Moyer and our very special guest, Cynthia McKinney. We'll be back with another show very soon. The website is offplanetradio.com and the truth is out there. It's inside you. Keep looking for it.